Businesses thrive by knowing customer insights because today's insights are tomorrow's facts. At iResearch, we live and breathe insights. And despite searching high and low, we were unable to find a customer insights podcast that answers one of the most important questions in business. Why do customers do what they do? So we launched one. Hi, I'm your host, Darshan Mehta. My guest on this episode is Steve Kroll. He is the CEO and co-founder of Be Found Online, a strategy-driven, people-focused digital marketing agency connecting brands and humans in innovative ways. Steve's focus is keeping the agency ahead of the curve in terms of people and delivery. Steve, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing wonderfully, Darshan. Thank you so much for having me in the conversations leading up to this brief 45 minutes. I've Truly enjoyed getting to know you, so I'm really looking forward to what comes out of the next little bit here. Yeah, pleasure been mine as well. So, as we get started, you have self-proclaimed yourself as an expert in unleadership. <laughs> what is unleadership? <laughs> expert, expert is kind of a tough word because uh, unleadership is a bit undeveloped. But it's this idea that we're preached leadership from so many different directions, and if you were to look at at the Harvard Business Review over the years, there were there were four traits of leaders. There were six traits of leaders. You could probably find eight or 10. And even last week, I was with a good friend of mine, Amber, and she's going to start teaching our broader team leadership. And there's self-leadership, there's team leadership. And then within each of those, there's more and more and more. And for me, this idea of unleadership is if you're a decent human being, if you're true to yourself, you'll be true to your team. So lean on that first and your leadership characteristics will come, come into play. And then you can refine around there. I think we're all leaders. We wake up in the morning. We have to decide to put our pants on. We have to decide to get out of bed. We have to decide to go to work. That's all leadership. And the way we handle ourselves becomes that unleadership. We don't need books to tell us how to lead. We simply need to go about leading. I'm curious, how did you come about this way of thinking or philosophy? I don't think this is something you just woke up with. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm more than anything. I'm really curious because I think this is something that happened over time. And I have a feeling there's some events that were pivotal in your life that brought you to that point and this understanding. Um, it's funny. It's funny you should ask. It comes out of being in, in several successive roles and not having good mentors. Or, or people leading the departments and or the companies that I was a part of. And, and there's some great people along the way too. Um, there's a fellow by the name of Jonathan Horton, who I worked for for a brief moment in time. If he called me tomorrow and asked me to come to work for him, I would probably drop everything and go to work for Jonathan Horton. Uh, but there's some others in there who remain nameless and faceless, who just led myself and departments and people it not they, they didn't do it intentionally. I just don't think that they were they were ready for the roles they were in. And it, myself being beneath there, I didn't want to. I wasn't trying to criticize them. I was trying to figure out how to work with them. And then ultimately, that put me on my own journey to think about how I want to treat people, how I want to treat teams, and how I want to be treated. So it started. It started well over twenty years ago. No doubt about that. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your journey to uh, kind of the beginning and how you got to where you are now with uh, being the founder of Be Found Online? <laughs> there's, a, there's a very simple answer for it, is that um, I, I found myself at odds with some of the structures and culture in large environments in, in corporate America, as they say. And I came to realize that I was probably better served in smaller environments where I tend to be a bit outspoken. And I tend to have, I, I just have ideas. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of visionary. If you, if you study EOS at all, I, I, I sort of split visionary and integrator in the middle and I've got ideas, but I'm a problem solver. And I was, it was kind of, uh, it was difficult in corporate America at times, especially when I ran out of good mentors to, to find my way. And I just sort of, there was a point where I was liberated after an acquisition in early 2006. And I had moonlighted a bit and started a couple of companies, shuttered a few companies all at night and evenings and weekends. And I was gaining progressive jobs in technology. Um, I could have continued jobs in technology, managing operations and managing infrastructure. And I had gotten this taste for digital marketing through a couple of the developers that I was managing at the time. And 
when I found myself out there looking around trying to ask myself what's next, I had fell in, fallen in love with digital marketing. And it was actually a breakfast with my wife. She just looked over the, across the table and said, why don't you do it? I said, do what? She said, we'll start the business. I said, what? <laughs> what kind of crazy is that? <laughs> and she told me, she said, I'd rather, I'd rather have you try and fail than be bitter at 50 years old. So go give it a shot. And it was funny coming from her because she's, I always thought that she wanted me to go, you know, work a nine to five straight away and, and not bring work home with me. And, and, you know, we could worry about everything else later. And, and she pushed me into it. She's been my guide ever since. That's great. So tell me, how do you, um, give me some examples of how you do on leadership at your company on a regular basis. Um, well, now it's it's really become what I found. My struggle was that I was learning and I was growing and I was thinking. And have you ever gone to a conference, Darshan, where you where you had a team back at back at the home base? And you went to a conference and you learned all of these things and it was wonderful and you were energized and you came back and you shit all over everybody's desk. <laughs> all all of the ideas you just bleh, all over the place. Um, I came to realize that that's not productive, nor is it effective. And I wanted to start bringing leadership to the rest of the team. And it's hard to do. Um, one is money is a concern. Time is a concern. Who's your leadership coach? Not every coach will work for every person. So it, it I don't know, it became a little bit of a struggle to bring it back. So it's this idea that um, when I think about on leadership today, it's about working with um, coaches and leadership coaches, executive coaches, whatever they are, we built instead of Steve has all the answers or Dan, my partner, has all the answers. We live from an organizational playbook today where I might have an opinion, you may have an opinion, three other people might, but our job is to balance it against the organizational playbook, which not only contains the mission, vision, and values, it talks about who we are as an organization and sort of our DNA, but then it also gets to the practical stuff. Who do we want to be when we grow up? <laughs> you know, uh, what are those things? What are the things that we're not willing to compromise on, right? And then there's also financials in there. It's all baked in. We update it once a year, and that becomes sort of our, our manifesto on the year. And unleadership to me is leveraging those things. It's not the buck stops at Steve. And sometimes it has to because everybody has a boss, as they say. But more times than not, we're quoting the organizational playbook in having these conversations. If there's a bad client or a bad relationship or a bad employee, we're talking to talking about the playbook first so that we have something to base it on. And I, I look at that and that provides everybody else in the organization the opportunity to be a leader in those moments when they have to think about making a decision. And I want to distribute the decision-making. I don't want everything to land on my desk. You know, one of the things I'm hearing and something that I realized in teaching, and that is that you can't tell people what to do by just saying, hey, you know, I want to save you some steps and here's my experience. I've learned you actually have to give people feedback, but more than anything, they learn more by experience. And I think that's what I'm hearing you saying. Is that what leadership is about as well? Yeah, you hit it on the head. It's about letting people run into those walls. Um, if they run into the wall, ow, wait a minute, I don't want to hit that wall again. And, and you have to let them go. You have to give them the latitude to make those mistakes and run into those walls. You see it. It's over there. Well, well, there goes Susie. <laughs> you just and you sort of have to, but that's that's ultimately affording them the opportunity to grow. And here's the thing: the catch twenty two is if they ask you before they get to the wall, "Hey, Steve, I see a problem ahead. What do you think?" Well, absolutely, I'm going to help as much as I can, right? But I'm not going to move the wall. That's that's up to them to figure out how to move the wall. It's I have a note on my board here that says, "Ask more and tell less." It's this idea that when they're faced with those situations and they want to have the conversations, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. <laughs> I may have the answer. And I people give me give a hard time from time to time. They look at me when we're done and say, you knew the answer to that. Yeah, but the key was helping you find it. Actually, if you can move the wall, then you have more control than I do because I've learned that I have control over nothing. Uh, I barely have control <laughs> over me, you know? That's, so the extent yeah, of yeah. control I have in this entire role is me half the time. And no, it's just usually it, like you know? <laughs> breaking out of prison. You get a little spoon. <laughs> kind of a little hole in it. <laughs> so I'm curious. Um, I have a feeling as a result of this unleadership philosophy and way of doing things, you must have found a way to maybe even screen candidates that you want to hire and bring on your team. And how do you do that? Um, 
I don't know that unleadership plays a huge role in that. A lot of it is our culture that plays a role there. And we do want people that fit the culture. So we do some screening for emotional intelligence. We we have a series of questions and we have a series of interviews. So we do some. We want to make sure that people are a good fit for the team. And we had a run where we didn't do such a great job. And we brought in some folks that weren't a good fit. And honestly, we suffered as a result. And the last several folks, we we rebooted our hiring um, framework two, two and a half years ago, because everything needs love from time to time. You need to tweak things, right? Process is never, it's never final. So we tweaked it and we've, we're really happy with uh, the team we've been able to recruit most recently, as well as the framework that we're using. So it's, it's all been kind of fun. It's been great uh, having some fresh new faces on the team, some new energy and new ideas as well. You talked about taking a stand in what you believe in. And I'm curious, what's the key to knowing when to stand up versus when to listen? Well, this is this is a good question, right? In the wake of the whole Chris Rock and uh, and Will Smith thing, <laughs> when do you stand up? Um, which, by the way, I have to say, I am I am forcibly ignoring the entire thing. I, uh, they're talking; to people are publishing leadership lessons and emotional intelligence shown by this person or that person. I think, okay, I don't need it. Um, it's hard to know, isn't it, when to stand up? You, you sometimes you get pushed around for so long, and you finally just have to say, "Hey, we can't do this anymore." Or there have been times I've lost quality people because we've turned toward the money. And, and sometimes in an organization, you've grown companies, you, you need the money. <laughs> money. Money makes all the happy things happen, right? You can't have nice things if you don't have the money. So there's this trade-off at times. And, and it's those times when you know I, I look back to firing our largest client at our largest partner and putting ultimately what accounted and and we all talk about client concentration issues in the agency space and we had about 50 percent of our eggs in that basket and we were firing the largest client that came through there but we decided at that point in time it was the right thing to do for our team and our organization and that was better than any money that we were going to get but it took a long time to get there so um, so sometimes it's instantaneous when you go, we have to take a stand, but most times it's, it's sort of a slow, painful, sort of, <laughs> um, sort of this eye opening. Hmm. We should probably take a stand. All right, let's talk about it next week. <laughs> you finally reach a point and then, and then you spend another, another couple of months saying, how are we going to have this conversation and not get ourselves fired from the whole portfolio? Let's see if we can figure that one out too. So it's it's tough. There's never never it's never cut and dry. Actually, you know, I don't think the problem is taking the stand because I think a lot of times, regardless of what end of the stand someone uh, ends up on, let's say that you're taking the stand with, they actually will respect you. I think the issue comes is how do you communicate that stand right, and how do you enact it? Yeah. I mean, kind yeah. of going back to what you started with the example with uh, Chris Rock and uh, Will Smith, you know, uh, there were. Uh, plenty of other ways you could have taken a stand, right? Um, but I think it's a matter of how you actually take the stand that can lead to all kinds of complications, ramifications. It's funny you asked about on leadership and, and goes into leadership coaching. One of the things that I focused on as a leader, I found myself having different deficiencies at different times as a leader. What do I want to focus on? And my most recent coach over the last three years or so has helped me with communication strategies having difficult conversations, framing difficult conversations so that they don't go off the rails, so that you can walk into a room and and put it on the table where you're using inarguable facts and you're stating facts, you're telling your story, and then you're sharing feelings. And it's really hard to argue with feelings. So you set it up and then you, you turn around and you ask a question. And this, it, it works. And in, in sometimes it, it, it's weird to try and play the game, but Ultimately, I'm trying to get it ingrained in my thinking still so that in those situations, well, I'll frame out an argument and I'll try several different varieties of it because messaging, to your point, is so important. You can come in like a bull in a china shop and you'll get nothing that you want. <laughs> if you come in a little bit softer than that, you'll get a little better. If you come in trying to make peace with, with some answers and questions, then the odds are pretty good that you're not going to be met with the punch in the face that we've talked about before. It's like, you're not going to get out of my office. <laughs> it doesn't happen nearly as often. I can't give you that. Get out of here. <laughs> Speaking of punch in the face, uh, you said 
that in every punch in the face, there's a lesson. Break this down for me and tell me, uh, is there a lesson you've learned that you'd like to share? Thankfully, as I've grown older, they're more figurative than literal in terms of punches <laughs> in the face. So I'll, I'll tell you, um, it, it's this idea that every time, it's that whole thing about you know getting knocked down, you got to get up again. You can stay down, you can hide your head in the sand. And I'll use my wife's cancer. We talked about it in the pre-show and everything else. It's like, that's a, that's a big punch in the face. Um, woke up one morning and she's diagnosed with stage four disease. And you go, what the heck am I going to do with this? And it's interesting. Um, it was right at the start of COVID. So our business dropped, I don't know, 30, 40% in the in Q2 of, of 2020 or Q3. Here she is ramping up to start chemo and she's still smiling. She's still face forward. And I can count on one hand the number of days that she had a pity party. And, and you and I've talked, you've been, you've been through it. And, and it's pretty easy for people to hide their head in the sand and, and hope their cancer goes away. And, and sort of, you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, you do your thing, but she never, she never settled. And she, and that's motivation for me. So, well, she got punched really, really hard. I got, I got the other punch, but it's that idea of how do you get up? How do you keep going? How do you motivate yourself? And, and I'll tell you, that my mind was mud for a while there, but at some point you, you still realize that you've got things to do. You've got kids in the house, <laughs> you've got you've got a business, you've got a wife, you've got a family, you've got these things to take care of. So you can't just run away from all of that. And and more, and that, that's sort of a grand example on the smaller scale. We win and lose customers, we might lose quality humans in our organizations. Those are all little punches in the face. And Every one of those presents an opportunity if you're willing to listen to the advice that comes with it. So what happened to lead you to losing the customer? What happened to lead you to losing the key employee? How do you, how do you work through those things? And how do, you, how do you help? You can't always prevent it, but how do you help that make sure it doesn't happen again or, or try like heck to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think when you get punched in the face, especially, you know, I'm sorry about your wife, uh, about cancer. Uh, as I told you, I went through it with my mom. And I know one of the first things she asked, and I suspect this is probably similar to your wife, is that my mom wanted to know, why me? You know, I've been a good person. I've done all the right yeah. things. Why right. me? You know, and that's that's a personal oh, yeah. punch in the face for for them that has a cancer. But then, you know, of course, you know, for you know, the, the people around that person, that's also a punch in the face. But, you know, you realize you had to be strong for her, for her to be strong. And, you know, I think it's one of the things when you get punched in the face, you, of course, there's going to be some pain, a little bit of movement back and, and, and feeling it. But at some point, you kind of put that inside and say, hey, where's the learning in here? And how can I be even stronger coming out of it? Because what are the choices do you really have, right? Yeah. Well, and Michael Hyatt says it, um, and a lot of other people have said it, that you can't learn with your mouth open. <laughs> so, so shut up just for a brief second. And, and if you get punched in the face, okay, we'll use, we'll use Chris Rock got slapped. Huh. If, if he stopped for a moment and said, what did I do? How might I do something differently next time? Now, I'm not sure what went through his mind, but there's also a philosophy in improv where in improv, um, the immortal Del Close talks about yes and. And the idea there is that if you were to say something and I yes, but you we're, we're going down a spiral that way. If I yes and you, I'm building on whatever crazy idea you have. And then furthering that idea he'll go as far as saying, what I want you to do, your, your, your brain is much faster than your mouth. Let the first thought go. And if you're good, let the second one go too. The third thought will be a really crisp and clean thought. So close your mouth, let your brain do the work and then speak. And it's worked out well for me. I took some improv only after I started what I call this wonderful mess, because I thought it would help me in sales. Right. Yeah, um, I know you run a people-focused business, and you're really, uh, I think, uh, big on having client relationships and stuff. So, tell me how you do things different than what you see some of your other peers or other uh, companies and in other industries do. That you know that you've learned has, has made you more successful. It, it's hard to compare. I'm not in the trenches with those organizations. I, I will say one of the things that we like to think about is that your customer experience should equal our performance. So I, I, I often use an example of a, a pizza parlor. Um, if you go to a pizza parlor and you get great pizza 
and great service, what are you going to do? You're going to tell your friends, right? If you get great pizza and crummy service, mm, man, the pizza was really, really good. Maybe it was our server. He was having a bad day. Not sure, but give it a shot. I'll go back one more time. Okay, flip it. Great service, crappy pizza. Man, what a wonderful environment, but the food was kind of, ugh. And then if they're both crummy, well, now you're telling a lot more people about it. So you strive for both of these things to be strong. And to do that, it can't just be checklist digital marketing. It's not, I'm handing you a report, you're handing me money, I'm handing you a report, you're handing me money. We have to have some sort of relationship, some sort of common understanding. So what we strive for in hiring now, granted, in the digital space, just like in the web development space, there are a lot of introverts. We have a lot of introverts that hide behind the curtain. They're on client calls because they do like social interaction in a, in a lot of cases, but they don't want to be the, the face and the voice. But we want people on the front lines who thrive on relationships and gaining some understanding of the people that they're working with and having that shared understanding. And what I believe is that that gives you room to have some of those tough conversations when things may not be going as well. I And I'm not looking for latitude. I'm just looking for shared experience. And so that we can have that tough conversation. Oh, you know what? Performance was down 25% last, last quarter. And we can start talking about what we're going to do about it. If we don't have that relationship, I'm not sure what to expect and I'm not sure how to phrase it. So I'm, I'm testing the water and I might get punched in the face. <laughs> What do you find are common mistakes that often lead to this mismatch between the experience and the delivery? Oh wow, it can be it can be a lot. There it could just be personality differences between people. And we to the, to the point you made earlier about bringing on a great team, we try to interview our clients as well. We had a really really tough customer. We've had several along the way. And the idea of having, you know, we had one client years ago where our results were stellar and the client was simply put not a joy to deal with. And no matter what, nothing was good enough. And so we couldn't forge this client bond. We couldn't get to the point where he was appreciative of the work we were doing, even though we were working really hard and we were delivering incredible performance. He just couldn't get over the fact that there's more, there's more, there's more, keep pushing, keep pushing. and. His personality was such that it just wasn't a fit for the way we want to work. We want to we want to be good at what we do and we want to enjoy our work. So if you're constantly pressing and pushing my buttons and, and striving for more, we always want more. We're not shy. We're not going to run away from it. But it's it's that coach that gets there and screams at all of his players. <laughs> yeah, I want more. We're gonna, you know. So there's a time and a place for it, but. There's more of that motivational speech that gets more out of your team than than pointing fingers and and pushing really, really hard. So it's that sort of thing. We find more of those circumstances where we've got mismatched personalities or mismatched client expectations. The client expectations piece, that's something that I think every agency actively works on, right? We all want to be a little more strategic. And if we share goals and metrics and know where we want to go, then it's easier to have those conversations and harder for those to be mismatched. But I'll say it still happens. Shift gears and talk about digital marketing. How has digital marketing changed as a result of COVID? Wow. Um, well, there's a lot more money moving into digital or it's moved into digital. What's interesting now is um, I think a lot of the changes were happening already, but there's been a huge growth in direct-to-consumer brands. And they're sort of on the bubble right now to say what's going to happen as we all start taking off our masks and are seen socially again. So there's worry there. Along the way, you know, there was the whole threat of death of the cookie from Google, which they kicked down the road another year. But now we have changes in analytics, changes in privacy and things. So the landscape is shifting pretty dramatically where we saw a lot of the money and opportunity pour online because we were stuck at home. You saw Amazon hit all-time highs in terms of you know, just products being shipped and delivered. And what we're seeing now is, I think, a lot of that's going to stay. The people have figured out some of the convenience. Um, the door dashes of the world have now found their place where I used to run down to the little local local place and get my, you know, my Greek dinner. Um, now I'll have it delivered and I don't worry about the cost so much anymore. And all the little mom and pop restaurants have signed up for DoorDash where, I don't know, 
rewind a couple of years, they were resistant. They didn't want to pay the fees. They didn't, they didn't want to raise their prices. And now I imagine so there's, there are probably quite a few success stories out there about successes people have had with the Uber Eats and the DoorDashes of the world. So a lot of those changes, those convenience changes are going to be with us. That was a huge shift online. A lot of the money poured online. But now in the wake of that, you know, where, where are we now? We've got um, shipping and logistics and manufacturing challenges. I've got a client who whose budget's gone because he, he can't get product. He says, well, I can't advertise if I have nothing to sell. So he's having a lot of trouble getting product to sell. He's in the golf business and finding, finding equipment right now is very, very difficult. So manufacturers have it, but they only have a limited supply. Last year's supply is gone. So he used to be able to sell older stuff, um, but he, he can't find it anymore. Wow. So what type of digital marketing does your agency do? So we are in the paid or paid and organic media spaces and the analytics space. So we like to tell stories with data. If we don't have a number we're shooting for, then why are we working with you? And then on the organic side, we're really strong at driving more traffic to websites, helping people figure out what the website's about and filling out forms. And on the paid media side, whether it's paid search via the Googles of the world or paid social media, LinkedIn and Facebook or programmatic media, the display ads, our role in that is to cost effectively convince people to fill out forms or buy things on your website. It's, it sounds a little cliche at that, but our job really in a nutshell is to drive traffic to websites through, but be it organic or paid means, and then be able to track that revenue when it gets there. Do you also do uh, uh, click funnels and so on as well? Uh, we do some click funneling. We don't, we don't build those landing pages. Typically those are clients we will on occasion do the creative and build out the landing pages. Um, but we will study click funnels in terms of conversion rate optimization, understanding, well, mm -hmm. you've got five steps, but three will do. And by the way, your button shouldn't be lime green. Maybe you should try orange or blue, things like that. Where do you see digital marketing heading into the future? And, and also what role do you think, you know, augmented reality is going to play in all of this? Well, we've got AR, you've got AI, you've got, um, it's going to be interesting. Um, it's funny. I, I Most of the team are in their 20s and 30s. So I thought I would have heard a lot about the metaverse, but I don't. They haven't said a word about the metaverse. Um, it's Right now, it's somebody's dream about AR. We are seeing it some on your phones, you know, Google's little augmented realities and some other people using the tools to say, hey, what is this donut chop cell kind of thing? Um, and that's cool stuff. And I think we're going to see that. I think we haven't figured out how to advertise on voice search yet, but we're all using it. So we're using it more and more. Your Alexas, your Googles, your Siri's. It's pretty hard to show me six ads and charge people for all of them on uh, what if I'm asking for something on Alexa. So so that advertising model has to, has to shift. And some people want to say that, that Google's got that figured out or Amazon has that figured out. And... I'd like to believe they do, but I thought I think we'd see more of it by now if that were the case. I don't know if they'll charge more for those ads. So we're moving in, in those directions. And now we have analytics. The whole landscape is changing because cookies are going away. We've got data privacy issues in Europe where um, companies are actually being told that using Google Analytics is illegal. So... You've got a few firms and a few governments who've said, sorry, as an organization, your business headquartered in, I think it was France and one more, like somewhere else anyway, where the cases were. And they said, sorry, it's illegal for you to use Google Analytics because of the GDPR rules are stronger than the data transfer rules between the EU and the US. And so, sorry, you break GDPR here. So now Google is, they might be pushing the envelope on some of their rollouts and things, but we're going to see a huge shift away from IP addresses and cookies. And we're going to start seeing, I don't know, it's, you've got to own your first party data and it's going to be harder to plug in your third party data. So we've gotten accustomed to, I can go out and I can build audience models that look like any cohort in the world. And I can apply those on most platforms now. And I can marry my first party information to that third party information. I'm going to have a harder time doing that. The tools will still be there, but it, it's going to be a little bit trickier to get out there and advertise effectively. I think we're going to have a settling out period for the next couple of years. 
as we start evolving into this cookie-less world and as data privacy concerns become more and more at the forefront. How should companies and brands adapt starting now or they should wait since some of these changes are actually implemented? Ooh, <laughs> it's an interesting question. A lot of folks are saying with um, GA4, Google Analytics 4 being available and Universal Analytics now being sunsetted toward the middle of next year, if you want a year-over-year -year comp data set, you should get your GA4 set up sooner rather than later. We've got a few customers who have gotten that message. We didn't send the memo. I'm, I'll send the memo to folks. They can hear it. If you want year-over-year -year data, by the time they sunset this stuff, you need to get going now. So you've got a, a comp data set between Universal Analytics and GA4. You can have both in a year, and then you can sunset this one, and you'll have data to compare against. So great. Get GA4 set up. Get your Universal Analytics there, and then whoop, make that migration. So we're seeing some people get on there now. Um, some people are, are threatening to move away from Google Analytics. So some of the smaller analytics firms that went by the wayside when, when Google uh, bought, what did they buy? Man, it was, it was so long ago, I forget the name of the company they bought, but um, they made analytics free for everybody. So we're all on Google Analytics, but now the privacy concerns and the GDPR concerns are forcing the hand a little bit. I've read some articles where people are looking for new analytics providers. Who can I use that's not going to be illegal? So uh, they're looking at some of those things. I don't think any of our clients is really considering moving away from Google Analytics, but we have a few who've got international operations who are concerned about the future of Google Analytics and, and their tracking. Is there an area of digital marketing that you'd like to delve into further and why? I nerd out in all of it. <laughs> Um, I think it's always, it's that question about what do you want to study personally? What do you want to learn? And then what's best for the agency and separating the ideas from the reality. And I think as an agency, we want to do more Amazon work and with Walmart um, getting into that game. And you've got people like Wayfair, all these people offering shops and stores. Uh, they're all going to have advertising platforms. And I don't know what that means for customers yet, but to keep a finger on the pulse of that. I think it goes a long way in terms of what the future of e-commerce really is. So that's really exciting and interesting to me. That plus all the data and tracking that goes into that too. So you, you throw those things together and you've got a bowl of spaghetti and you're not sure exactly how it's going to work out, but um, it's, it's best to do your part to start studying that and figuring out where you might play a role and who's going to win. I don't think Google doesn't publish this, but um, for Google ads, the revenue is trailing a little bit. It used to be their their breadwinner, but Google, uh, YouTube is now where they're making they're they're growing in leaps and bounds. Now Google's still making plenty of money. Don't get me wrong. It's just that Google Ads, your typical top of page and right rail ads, they've they've dropped a little bit in the last few years. They're still printing money, but they're not printing as much or growing as fast. Now you can argue that it's competition. Um, you can argue that we all have blindness to it now. Um, but it, it's the landscape's changing, albeit slowly. YouTube's picking up, social ads are picking up. If TikTok ever figures out an ad platform, um, they'll grow exponentially. Um, right now, it's all influencer generated, so most of that money's not even not even moving through TikTok. It's moving through the influencers that support <laughs> that are on the platform. Hmm. Interesting. I want to go back to something you and I talked about earlier, and I think it's all related to to the leadership and also your company and stuff. And that is, we talked about your wife having cancer, but I understand. Your co-founder and his wife uh, were diagnosed uh, with, not your co-founder, but I mean, his wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2020. First of all, how, how are they doing? Um, they are, are fighting the good fight um, one day at a time. She's um, still fighting. She's still in the fight. They've been, uh, been working through some things, trying to find um, doctors and clinics and trials uh, because the first round of chemo, as you know, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Uh, surgery doesn't appear to be an option for her. Um, so they're looking at some other options. So they're still fighting. They're doing a lot of traveling right now, which has got to be very difficult for her. So my heart goes out to her. But uh, they're still in the fight. And to see her and see her smile and her glow, it's amazing. Um, just uh, it's it's crazy when, when people are forced to fight for their lives like that, um, what kind of energy they can generate. Having been through this yourself now, um, I'm curious how... What advice would you give to someone else that may be starting to go down this path, you know, of finding a, a cancer diagnosis for a loved one, but also running a business? 
And I mean, how did you handle all that? I mean, having kind of been through all that now, what kind of advice do you wish you were given as you started this whole um, journey down this path? Oh, it's funny. I woke up this morning wondering a few things. Um, first of all, a tip of the cap to the entire team at BFO. Um, they stood on their heads for me. They've stood on their heads for Dan. Um, it's an amazing group of humans that come together and support one another. And I've always talked about having a supportive culture and a supportive environment. If you need time for personal issues, take that time. Just never thought that person would be me. And in 2020, I took four months off as Roxanne started chemotherapy. And um, in the book, In Traction, Gino Wickman's book, he talks about letting go of the vine. And as a founder, you can let go of the vine. And, and that's the best way to, to support and empower your team. Well, it's weird because you might think you've been letting go of the vine, but it, it, it's weird for me, at least, until I went through that. I didn't know what letting go of the vine was. And <laughs> you have to let go of everything in the business. There's there's very little you can hold on to and because you just don't have the time for it. I found that my mind was mud. And... I wanted to work because it was a distraction, but I wasn't productive. I, I made so many little messes that people had to clean up for me. I didn't complete anything because, of course, that's more important than cancer and, and, and working with doctors and all those other things. You know, you get a phone call, you have to answer it. Um, well, I'm sure you so became the advocate for, for uh, you know, your wife. And I had to do that for my mom because I realized, you know, when, when the person is sick, they can't think clearly and hear everything the doctor's saying and, and process it all. You really need someone there to kind of be your eyes, ears, and, and, and you know, the, the analyzer as well. And so it's I'm sure you went filter. through that the same thing, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Her filter is so much different than mine. You heard what? <laughs> there are right. a few of those moments. My, my advice in hindsight now, having been through it, is to prepare your team as best you can for, excuse the expression, but the day you get hit by a bus. I, I got hit by a bus and I was, I was out. I was, I was useless for a couple of months before I was out. And, and then I was out. And then it's crazy. As soon as I came back, I came back um, fourth quarter of 2020, late, mid, mid fourth quarter, October sometime. And Dan's wife was diagnosed the last week of the year. So we had about two or three two months of overlap of being back in the office together before he's been gone since. And, and we chat from time to time. We try to connect and catch up, but um, it's really interesting. My experience um, was able to be shared with him in terms of, Hey, get out of here. Don't worry about us. We'll be okay. We'll figure it out. You take care of your wife. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I hope he saw that as our trying to save him from the headache of trying to do all of those things at one time, but he's also got three little kids too. So he's, he's got his hands full. There's no doubt. Well, wow. so I'm curious, having gone through this experience, how has it changed your outlook or your approach to things? Their embrace, empower, and encourage uh, the team. Give them all the latitude in the world. There are amazing people all, all around us. And I'm shutting up more. I'm listening more and I'm asking more questions. And for as much as I thought I did before, Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But now it's really the idea of I want to, I want, I want the company to be about the people who work here. Sure, it's about our clients and our clients have a say in that, but I want people to know um, they've got safety, psychological safety, financial safety. And so everything I do now is is focused on helping individuals and teams grow. And very rarely am I brought into client situations. In fact, I found myself getting too close to a client situation last week. And just yesterday, I pushed back. I told the team, I said, hey, I feel like I'm getting too close and it's getting into, the, it may, it has a chance to get in the way of the great work everybody's doing. So I'm going to take a step back. And um, and then I asked a bunch of questions <laughs> and, uh, and I, I sort of let it go at that. I'll, I'm happy to get involved if needed, but um, to your point is let people get out there and let them try it, let them do it. And the things that are being built are amazing. The, the the things that we're doing for clients are wonderful. So so for me, it's it's prepare your team early. And going forward, we're actually rolling out. I don't think the team knows this yet. It's it's not exactly super secret though either. I talked about coming back from conferences, whether they leadership conferences or digital marketing conferences with a head full of ideas and throwing up all over the place and giving people all sorts of extra work to do. Well, 
instead of doing that, we're rolling out leadership training for the entire team. So we're making it so it's not too much of a time commitment. We're working with a couple of wonderful leadership coaches and also self-compassion coaches. So we're doing self-compassion and leadership training once a month. We're, we're starting. It's a pilot program. I've said, hey, do we want to start with just the leadership team? And no. We said, no, let's start with everybody. Everybody here's a leader. And the first part of learning leadership is leading self. So if we can teach everybody to lead self, maybe we'll break out some other smaller groups, but we're going to try it and we're going to see how it works out. So we'll do 90 minutes a month. It'll be small homework assignments, but my goal is to do what I can to develop the entire team. What do you think will come out of that? I'm just curious. I think you must have a little bit of an idea and you'll know more once you do it, but I I am curious. Well, so my my mantra in all of what I do is that my responsibility to you as, as an employee is to help you get ready, prepare for your next job, whether that's with BFO or somewhere else. So my job is to help you grow. and we're always about the practical skills in a role. Go go get a certification in this or go get a certification in that and figure out how to build a new spreadsheet. But what about the, the softer skills of this thing, the man- management leadership skills? What about taking care of yourself? I think in, in, for me, I know there are plenty of companies that um, don't give much mind to this stuff, but I care a lot about the humans, their well-being, um, their, how they're feeling. Uh, COVID's been rough on all of us. And... I got to imagine there, I mean, I've got four or five people that I've never met in person. And I imagine for larger companies, they've got dozens, if not hundreds of people that they've never met in person and quite possibly have never spoken to as a leader. So get out there, talk to your people. I meet with everybody on the team once a month for 20 to 30 minutes. As a matter of course, we don't, we talk shop if we need to, but mostly it's chit chat. It's, it's, it's uh, around the water cooler, Um, finding out, you know, oh, How's the dog doing? I heard he, you know, you know, whatever. He got out of the yard, uh, that kind of thing. Um, oh, your daughter? Oh, yeah, she's in band now. That's really cool. It's things like that. It, it's life because life is more than than our businesses. And like I said, we we talk shop if we need to. I'll ask some of those questions, but the day to day management of their roles and responsibilities that's up to the boss. Um, I have my one on ones with the people who report directly to me, but I have informal one on ones with everybody. In fact, for people that are that are local-ish, I'm trying to go to lunch with all of them now because we can go back outside. And then for the people who are remote, I try to meet them on their turf once a year. And I was moderately successful last year. There's a few people that I haven't met yet. I've got to get out to Washington State and Colorado and in somewhere in Ohio, I think, um, to meet some new team members. Well, you gave me the perfect segue to my last question. I always like to ask guests, and we've covered lots of different areas, so I'm going to give you a broad uh, choice here. Uh, who in the world of digital marketing and leadership, or even, uh, let's say, even cancer, since we talked about all these things, would you love to have lunch with and why? And if you want to give me a couple of people, that's fine, too. Wow. So it's funny. I read the quote about digital marketing prior to jumping on. That one is any, any agency owner, entrepreneur. Um, I, love, I love sharing the stories. Life in the trenches, growing your growing your practice. Um, those conversations are always wonderful. Um, leadership. Um, I get to talk to this guy all the time. My mentor, Tom Walter. Um, I haven't seen him in a few months, COVID and travel and things, but I'll see him next month. Um, so it, it's weird. I, I take a conversation with anybody. Um, all the books on my shelf. Uh, <laughs> let's just. I can't think of the name. I'm trying to find something here and I can't think of it. It's uh, Ken Blanchard. I'd love to sit down with like a Ken Blanchard or um, Collins, um, people like that who, who've written some of the business manifestos that we've all sort of read. Um, going way back, I would, um, I can't remember his name right now, but he wrote um, Servant Leadership back in the 70s and early 80s. I'd love to sit with him um, and and figure out what's on his mind. It's weird. You read the books and you try to figure out the personalities of the people. And then um, in the land of cancer, wowzers. Um, I'm a little, um, I'd go back and I would love to spend time with Max Gerson or Dr. Hoxley, who were alternative thinkers in the cancer space well before their day. Um, both believed that they had, had found um, treatments for cancer and had a lot of patients who swore by their treatments. Really interesting stuff. Um, 
I'd love to go talk to some of them and compare notes to, to some of the folks of today. But I'd also love to get in the heads of people at university to find out what they're really studying. That'd be pretty darn cool. How did I do well, Steve. <laughs> it's all over the place. <laughs> no, no, that's good. I think uh, you covered quite a bit there. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you very much for this conversation. Uh, we talked about leadership, uh, your digital marketing, but also I want to thank you for being willing to share your personal story and, and your partners. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I wish them the, the best uh, for, you know, her recovery. And uh, again, I want to thank you for, you know, sharing your experience and, and, and your guidance here. Wonderful. Thank you, Darshan. It was a pleasure being here. Love the questions, love the conversation, look forward to carrying on a relationship. Yep, I look forward to it as well. Thanks. Getting to AHA was brought to you by iResearch. To find out more about us, head to iResearch.com. And make sure to search for Getting to AHA in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. And don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>